la presentación de Super 7, eh, modelando con el estilo retro. Y tenemos aquí pues, a los responsables de la marca, ¿no? Que son Brian Flynn. Y Josh Herbonsheimer. Y tenemos a Luis Villagómez que va a encargarse de la moderación con el apoyo de Juan Mar. De Juan Mar. Y pues adelante. Bueno, antes, antes que nada, ¿ya se oye? ¿Sí? ¿No? Sí, bueno, sí. Hello. Bueno. Antes que nada, eh, quiero agradecer a todos los que están aquí presentes. Eh, para mí es un honor impresionante tener a la gente de Super Seven aquí, ya que es una compañía que ha estado por mucho tiempo eh, luchando para poder hacer cosas que los fans queremos y a raíz de que han obtenido tantas eh, licencias y oportunidades para poder producir eh, artículos eh, que nosotros queremos, para nosotros es un, un, un honor tenerlos aquí en México, entonces de verdad chicos, este, esto no es algo que pasa todos los días, de verdad. Luis es muy dulce. Luis es muy dulce. So, uh, we've been sort of asked to talk about the history of Super 7 a bit and talk about where we came from, how we got here, and the kind of things that we work on. Dice que van a hablar un poco de lo que es Super 7, de qué es lo que hacen, de dónde vienen, y en qué es en lo que están trabajando en este momento. So the first thing we like to always set up everything is we sort of have a company manifesto, sort of our motto. So everything that you see and hear from us is sort of filtered through this, which is we grew up with uh, giant monsters, comic books, punk, science fiction, skateboarding, robots, and rebellion. No one made what we wanted, so we made it ourselves. And what this kind of translates to in what we do is that for so much of us, we have the ideas of the things that we want to have, but we cannot find from anyone else, or we can't go buy from anyone else. So we just try to take all of those things that we grew up with and then just start making the things we want and hopefully they become the things that you want as well. Eh, muy bien, dice que todo lo que hacen, todo lo que se dedican, todo lo que representa su compañía se puede resumir en este que es su lema, su lema que lo tienen aquí que representa todo lo que son y que dice crecimos con monstruos gigantes, historietas, punk, ciencia ficción, patinetas, robots y rebelión, nadie hacía lo que nosotros queríamos así que lo empezamos a hacer nosotros mismos y dice que precisamente de eso se trata, hay muchas cosas que a ellos les gustaban que no encuentran quien las haga, eh, no encuentran quien se las pueda vender, entonces pues decidieron ellos empezar a hacer cosas que les gusten a ellos y esperan que a través de lo que les gusta a ellos también les pueda gustar a ustedes. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Creo que, que es correcto mi traducción. <laughs> so, uh, how Super 7 started actually in 2001, it started as a magazine that was essentially a glorified fanzine. So if I went way back to my old punk rock and skateboarding days, I made photocopied fanzines about bands and skateboarding and I wanted to do something that talked about my obsession with Japanese monster toys and other toys. So in, luckily at that time it was the advent of digital photography as well as I, working as a designer I knew how to do back-end pre-press so I was able to actually make a magazine that looked professional but was still essentially done just like a homemade fanzine. Okay, dice que Super 7 como inició, inició en 2001 como una revista, originalmente que no era más que una, una fanzine glorificada, donde pues él recordó su época de las patinetas y todos sus gustos y donde fotocopiaba cosas y empezó a hacer una revista aprovechando sus conocimientos de, de prensa y de, y de diseño gráfico, pudo dar una revista que pareciera profesional pero que al mismo tiempo tuviera esa sensación de ser un fanzine y donde pudiera hablar de su gusto por los juguetes japoneses y los monstruos japoneses. And when we really made the magazine in the beginning, we really didn't expect there to be an audience for the magazine very much. We, we basically just set ourselves up to hopefully break even. Maybe, maybe makes, if we only lost a little bit of money, then we would get the magazine for free. So everything sort of to this day is still set up along the same idea, which is I want to make this thing. And if I can just sell enough to pay for the cost, then I win, rather than the idea of 
how much money can we make on this? I just want to make the thing and have the thing and share it with other people that are interested in it. Dice que al final de cuentas la revista la empezaron sin un afán de ganar dinero, realmente lo que les interesaba es si pudieran recuperar nada más los costos, con eso se daban por bien servidos o que perdieran lo mínimo. De hecho, cada vez que vendieran lo suficiente para recuperar costos, con eso se daban por bien servidos. Y dice que esa idea la han mantenido todo el tiempo con su trabajo, es decir, uh, vender lo suficiente para recuperar costos y no, no estar pensando en tiempos cuánto podemos ganar, sino ellos se dan por bien servidos simplemente con recuperar los costos. So, when we started the magazine, one of the first things we tried to do was copy some of the Japanese magazines that we read all the time. And at that time, in Japan, every magazine came with a coupon that you cut out for an exclusive repaint of a figure. So from the very first issue, we went to friends of ours that were in Japan and we asked for repaints of their toys for our magazine. So we started making repaints of Japanese monsters for Super 7, but when we approached making repaints of figures, it was done in a very different way than you would get if you were doing it in Japan. The stuff that was made in Japan is very linear in thought. So every paint reference is a reference to something that has already happened before. And we would take some of our toys and be like, okay, I want to make it glow in the dark with metallic green paint because it looks like this. And they would kind of go, well, why would you want to do that? And we're like, because it looks cool? It didn't get any. And so we started selling lots of figures because we were treating classic licenses in a way that they weren't treated with before and starting to do different things with paints and colors that hadn't been done before. Ok, dice que parte de lo que son sus inicios, ellos empezaron su revista basados en lo que veían en revistas japonesas y una característica de las revistas japonesas es que traían unos cupones para recordar en los que podías cambiarlos por un repaint de algunas figuras. Ellos decidieron pues, buscar amigos que estuvieran yendo a Japón, que les consiguieran estos repaints de las figuras para empezar a regalarlos. Pero la diferencia es que en Japón tiene una forma de pensar muy lineal, donde los repaints están basados en cosas que ya se habían hecho antes y ellos decidieron, no, nosotros queremos hacer algo distinto, Queremos que nuestras figuras brillen en la oscuridad o tengan acabados metálicos, cosas por el estilo. Y cuando la gente les preguntaba, bueno, ¿por qué lo están haciendo así? Dicen, pues porque se ve padre, se ve bien. Y entonces ellos querían hacer algo diferente, tratar a las franquicias y a estos monstruos de manera en la que no se habían tratado antes. So, so then what would happen is now our repaints of the figures are selling better than the figures from Japan. That then led the companies to ask us, like, okay, well, what else do you want to make? So as first as collectors, we started making what we called collection filler vinyls, which is they made a four inch and they made a six inch and they made a 12 inch, but they didn't make a nine inch. So I want the nine inch. I want all the things in my collection I don't have. Eh, en este caso dice que cuando empezaron a ver que sus figuras se vendían más que las figuras coleccionables de Japón, las compañías les dijeron, bueno, ¿qué más quieren hacer ustedes? Y lo que ellos empezaron a hacer fueron lo que llaman figuras como de relleno, donde dicen, ok, en esta colección tenemos la figura de tantas pulgadas, tantas pulgadas, tantas pulgadas, pero no existe la de nueve pulgadas. Entonces nosotros queremos hacer la de nueve pulgadas para que tengamos todos los tamaños de las figuras. Uh, so I'll stick here for a second. So what happened then for us was then those new toys that we designed started selling really well. So that sort of became a groundswell of allowing us to get into Japanese licensing, specifically with Godzilla and other characters, and start making many of our own toys, but with Japanese companies. En este caso dice que las ventas de sus personajes les permitieron poder accesar a otras franquicias japonesas, particularmente Godzilla, y empezaron a crear ya sus propios juguetes eh, basados en franquicias existentes. Uh, and then in 2004, we opened our first store in San Francisco. Uh, and this was kind of the thing, we wanted to make the shop that we wanted to go shop in. Now, none of us had ever worked in a retail store before, but we kind of was just like, how hard can it be to run a store? You buy things, you sell things, and maybe you make enough money to pay the rent. And we didn't really get much more complicated than that. And so this was actually the second iteration of the store, the first one was very small and it did very well, so we moved next door into a much bigger space. And we really just wanted to have a place where if you are an adult collector, you could come and look at all this stuff and just be like, okay, this is cool. And here's all the other things that besides the toys that are cool that go with it. 
Ok, en este caso dice que pues, después de esto pusieron su primer tienda en San Francisco y pensaban en una tienda que fuera algo así como la tienda a la que nosotros queremos ir, la tienda en que nosotros queremos visitar. Ellos nunca habían trabajado en una tienda de menudeo, entonces no sabían cómo se manejaba, pensaban que era algo muy fácil, no simplemente compras la mercancía, eh, la vendes, sacas dinero suficiente para pagar la renta. Eh, eh, la tienda que vemos aquí es la, la segunda versión, la primera era muy pequeña, después decidieron ampliarse y lo que querían es que hubiera más cosas que solo los juguetes que ustedes llegaran como coleccionistas adultos y vieran, ok, los juguetes están padres, pero también están todas estas cosas padres que nos están gustando y nos hacen sentir guau, wow, es lo que estaba buscando. And it's a little hard to see in this photo, but if you look at the back wall, the back wall is custom wallpaper we made for the store that's flocked, so it's fuzzy, and it's all the dead characters in Star Wars, so it's a memorial wallpaper to all the dead characters in Star Wars. And this will become important later on. But at this time, we were just like, I want to make something crazy for my store. We weren't thinking about it in bigger ways. Eh, en este caso dice que no se alcanza a ver en la foto, o no se alcanza a ver en la foto, pero que al fondo, el papel tapiz de la pared es está un poco borroso, pero estaba lleno de personajes fallecidos de Star Wars, era como un memorial para todos los personajes que habían muerto y ellos no pensaban que fuera a ser algo más grande, simplemente querían hacer algo que se viera diferente y que les gustara, que más adelante esto se volvió importante. And the other thing that we started doing when we opened the store was, we know everybody wants to buy the toys, but we started making t-shirts that went along with the toys that we made, because a lot of it was, as adults, I can't buy t-shirts that I want to wear. They're just a big picture of Darth Vader this big on the shirt that I don't feel comfortable wearing after like age 12. So, you know, we tried to then go back to all the different influences that we had and try to come back and make shirts about licenses that we cared about, but that we felt cool with wearing as adults. Ok, y en este caso dice que parte de los juguetes lo que querían vender en su tienda eran playeras, pero buscaban playeras que como adulto te sintieras a gusto vistiéndolas. Había esas playeras con la cara enorme de Darth Vader que después de los 12 años pues como que ya no te sientes a gusto. Entonces hicieron buscar aquellos este, diseños clásicos, aquellos diseños viejos que te hacían sentir a gusto, que te hacían sentir cómodo como adulto, poder usar con franquicias que les gustaran. So then, 2005 is when we did our first actual unique toy. It's a toy that we designed that isn't from anybody else. And this was actually a collaboration with a company in Japan called Secret Base. But this was the first time that we said, okay, we want to design our own characters, not licensed characters, and we want to do our own thing. And the Ghost Fighter was actually very, very popular. You know, once again, when we made it, we didn't know if it was going to sell or not. We just wanted to make our own toy, our own design. And then it's, it started a whole floodgate once we started making our own characters. En este caso dice que para 2005 decidieron sacar su primer juguete que no estuviera basado en ninguna franquicia, que fuera un diseño original de ellos, por eso se juntaron con una compañía japonesa que los ayudó a diseñar este personaje y lo que hizo fue abrir las puertas para mayores posibilidades a través de este personaje. Este personaje resultó ser bastante popular y pues les permitió abrirse a otras oportunidades. I mean, as an example, like Ghost Fighter, I think at this point we're on somewhere between 40 and 50 colorways of this figure. Just people keep wanting to buy it over and over again because it doesn't look like anything they can buy from anyone else. Y en este caso dice que esta figura de Ghost Fighter este, tenían como 40, 50, pero que la gente quería seguir comprando estas figuras porque no parecía algo que pudieras conseguir en cualquier otro lado. Parecía algo completamente único y diferente. So we kept making vinyls and doing more and more stuff in the vinyl world for many, many years. And then what happened in 2009 was uh, actually a friend of both of ours, Shane Turgeon, came to visit San Francisco and came to the store and saw the wallpaper. And he goes, well, you should make this license. You should get a license from, for Star Wars to make the wallpaper. And we kind of went, yeah, right. <laughs> like, that's not going to happen. And he goes, no, 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 you should talk to my friend Steve Sansweet. And does everybody know who Steve Sansweet is? Other than Gus Lopez, if you've ever read a Star Wars book, it was written by Steve Sansweet. So it was also kind of like, yeah, I'll just go talk to Steve, sure. And then he was like, no, no, no. He set up a meeting like the next day. We will meet Steve at Lucasfilm. And Steve goes, hold on. And he goes down the hall and he gets the head person sing for all licensing at Lucasfilm, pulls him into a room and says, Look at this cool wallpaper. You should let these guys make it. 
And as luck happens, his name was Paul Southern, he was the head of licensing, but he used to do all the licensing everywhere outside of America. So he had been to Japan and he knew about all the vinyl scene in Japan and he's the person that made the Kubricks and everything else. And he goes, oh, you guys do this stuff in Japan. I've seen your toys in Japan. What do you want to do with Star Wars? And you have to watch out because there's lots of restrictions around Hasbro, but what do you want to make? And so what we came back and said, the thing I want to make when I was a kid is I had little Star Wars figures and I had big Shogun Warriors. I want to make a Shogun Warriors Star Wars figure. And he kind of went, okay. <laughs> okay. En este caso dice que, bueno, se dedicaron mucho tiempo a hacer las figuras de vinil y después de esto llegó alguien a visitarlos y vio el, el papel tapiz de Star Wars y dijo, oigan, deberían de hacer esto. Y ellos dijeron, sí, ¿por qué no? Y le dijo, tengo un amigo que es Steve Sansuit y puede venir. Y dice, oh, sí, claro, le vas a hablar a Steve Sansuit. Total que él le dijo, eh, esta persona habló con Steve y consiguió una junta para el día siguiente. Estuvieron en la junta, llegó el jefe de licencias que se dedicaba a hacer las licencias fuera de Estados Unidos y dijeron, mira, este papel tapiz deberíamos permitirlo hacerlo. Ellos lo vieron y dijeron, bueno, ¿qué les gustaría hacer con la franquicia? Recuerden que tenemos algunas restricciones con Hasbro, que hay cosas que se pueden y no se pueden hacer. ¿Qué les interesaría hacer? Y ellos dijeron, bueno, nosotros teníamos las figuritas de Star Wars y teníamos las grandes figuras de los Shogun Warriors. Queremos hacer figuras de Star Wars de tamaño de los Shogun Warriors. Y se les autorizó. So this was the first time we actually did sort of like real large scale licensing. And quite honestly, we kind of bet the farm on the Super Shogun. We sort of took like, okay, we've been working on this for eight years. Here's all the money we have. We're going to try to make this, this Shogun Warrior because it's something I always wanted. I hope we can sell it because if we don't, we're out of business. <laughs> But it, same thing, there were enough people that grew up on Shogun Warriors and Star Wars that saw it and were like, oh, I have to have that. Where if you didn't grow up with those two things, people just looked at it and went, that's an ugly looking stormtrooper. Or one of the other comments was, this is damn George Lucas revisionist history. You know, stormtroopers can't fire their fists. And they're like, Sí, bueno, dice que después de esto empezaron a hacer los Shogun Warriors, metieron todo su dinero y toda su inversión en hacer algo que querían hacer y dice, pues está pensado en la gente que creció con Star Wars y los Shogun Warriors, si tú no conocías a los Shogun Warriors y no creciste con ellos, pues obviamente ibas a ver este Stormtrooper y decir que Stormtrooper tan horrible o maldito Star Lucas que hace revisión de la historia, los Stormtroopers no lanzan sus puños. So, after we did the Stormtrooper, uh, you know, we kept working on some of our licensing, but all of a sudden, people started noticing us. So in 2013, actually, Lego hired us to do a whole bunch of stuff around their Star Wars line. And this was right before Disney bought Lucasfilm. And Clone Wars was ending, some other stuff was ending, and they were worried about what was happening to the Star Wars franchise. So in the end, we ended up coming up with a whole concept around an animated show, which became um, the Yoda Chronicles. I don't know if anybody's seen it. They did a f just a couple before they got bought. But the idea was, we came back to them and said, if you wait for George Lucas to make great Star Wars stuff, it's not going to happen right now. He's gonna, the plan at that time was to release all the movies in 3D. And we're like, you have to start creating your own content around Star Wars for Lego. So we, we came up with the concept of the Yoda Chronicles show for them, and then we also did this big reveal in Times Square where we made a life-size X-Wing. And the original idea with the X-Wing was to get PR was we were actually going to taxi it into airports, pull it up to the gate at the airport, have a Jedi run out, go through security, have a battle, come back out, and then taxi back out on the X-Wing, and just create this sort of crazy viral thing like you're sitting at the airport and all of a sudden a, a life-size X-Wing flies up. But it's a life-size X-Wing made out of Lego. Because of 9-11 and all sorts of other security concerns, they couldn't do that. But instead, they did it in Times Square. So there was an actual life-size Lego X-Wing. Ok, en este caso dice que eh, ellos siguieron con las franquicias este, y les llegó una oportunidad de hacer algo con Lego y Star Wars. En este caso, estamos hablando de 2013, fue un poquito antes de que Disney comprara la franquicia. Eh, algunas series como 
Clone Wars estaban terminando, entonces no sabía qué iba a pasar con la franquicia. La gente dice, pues, si estás esperando a que George Lucas venga y haga algo grande con Star Wars, ahorita no va a pasar. Lo máximo que se estaba planeando en aquel entonces era volver a sacar las películas en 3D, pero de ahí en fuera no había otros planes, entonces ellos desarrollaron las ideas para un show de televisión con Lego, que eran las crónicas de Yoda, que de los cuales hicieron muy pocos episodios y también tenían esta otra idea curiosa de trabajar con Lego, de hacer una réplica a tamaño natural de un X-Wing. La idea original era llevar el X-Wing a los aeropuertos y hacer toda una escena en la que salió un soldado rebelde, eh, peleaba con alguien y se regresaba al X-Wing, este, pues todo, todo sonaba muy padre, pero pues la realidad es que después del 11 de septiembre pues no era tan fácil hacer este tipo de cosas, la seguridad en los aeropuertos campeó, entonces pues solamente se hizo el display de un X-Wing hecho de Lego en Times Square. So, also that year is when we started the reaction figures, and so after we made the Super Shogun Stormtrooper, we started working on the Super Shogun Boba Fett, but at the same time I was like, okay, what is the ultimate thing I want to make? I just made my Stormtrooper, what's the other thing I want? And what I remembered is there's an old issue of Tomart's magazine where they showed the prototypes of unreleased three and three quarter inch alien figures. And I was like, I want to make alien action figures. So we actually had to push Boba Fett to the side for a little while and then we used that money to go get a license from Fox and we tracked down all the original prototypes that were made of the alien and we remade the alien as actual action figures. Ok, y en este caso dice que después de eso pues querían ver qué seguía, ¿no? Ya habían hecho su Shogun Warrior del Stormtrooper, tenían planeado hacer un Shogun Warrior de Boba Fett, pero de repente recuerdan, bueno, ¿qué más queremos hacer? Y eh, recuerdan que en algún momento vieron una revista, las figuritas pequeñas de tres pulgadas de, de Alien como prototipos y dijeron, bueno, ¿por qué no buscamos, tomamos este dinero, dejamos un poco de lado lo de Boba Fett y vamos a tratar de conseguir con Fox la franquicia de Alien para recuperar estas estos moldes, estos prototipos y ahora sí hacer como figuras reales de tres pulgadas a los personajes de Alien. And when we actually made the first Alien reaction figures, we we were very cons we didn't really think that people would buy them because at that time and still, you know, action figures are very highly detailed, highly articulated, lots of paint apps, lots of likeness and when, and they, they everybody wants them for very very cheap prices. So when we went to San Diego Comic-Con with the first Alien figures, it was, I'm going with low likeness, low pain app, low articulation, and a high price point. So, needless to say, we weren't exactly thinking it was going to be a runaway success. In this case, when they made the figures, they didn't think pensado que fueran a ser exitosas o que se fueran a vender, al final de cuentas cuando empieza la línea de reaction, pues la gente estaba acostumbrada a la actualidad a figuras de acción más articuladas, con mayor parecido a los actores o a los personajes, con mejor calidad de pintura y a un precio económico y ellos llegan a la Comic Con de San Diego con figuras con poca articulación, que no se parecen a los actores o a los personajes, que tienen una calidad de pintura pues no como la que se espera y además llegan con un precio más elevado, no esperaban realmente que fueran a hacer un But the thing that was really great is when we did show up with them finally, what we realized that there was a lot of collectors that were all our age that were waiting for something that made them feel like they were a kid again, made them feel like they were playing with Star Wars and Kenner toys. And so reaction became a very big line for us and we still make it to this day. Y en este caso dice que cuando llegaron, pues se dieron cuenta que había muchos coleccionistas que son más o menos de su edad, que crecieron con la esperanza de tener figuras de Alien y de recordar las viejas figuras de, de Kenner, de Star Wars que tenían en su infancia y entonces todo esto pues hizo que empezaran a comprar algo que les recordaba su infancia. So, and you know, and then we just tried to have fun with it and make all the different things that we would have wanted as collectors. So we made a playset that looks just like the Kenner playsets with the plastic base and the cardboard backdrop. We made carrying cases. We've, we've made it, you know, we just tried to have a lot of fun with all the different alien products that we could make. En este caso dice que se decidieron hacer todo ese tipo de cosas que les hubiera gustado que te hacía sentir como, como niño, como con los juguetes Kenner y que tuvieran ese, ese sentido retro, entonces empezaron a hacer este set de juego con, con las bases de cartón en la, atrás para que tuvieran los fondos, empezaron a hacer maletines para cargar los personajes y todo que te hiciera sentir como recordando la infancia con los juguetes de Kenner. And then what happened not that long after is somebody that we had worked with a long time ago at Mattel named Mark Morse, 
was put in charge of the Masters of the Universe line. And Mark came to us after seeing what we've done with Star Wars, what we've done with Alien. You know, after seeing what we've done with Star Wars, what we've done with Alien, what we've done with Lego, and he basically said, you know, what would you like to do with Masters of the Universe? Can we do something different that is unexpected, that the fans are not looking for, that they don't know that they want? You know, what would be interesting? So we came back to them and said, this is, and said, okay, I want to make Masters of the Universe, but almost the concept of how it would have been developed by Mattel. I mean, by, yeah, huh? Kenner. By Kenner. But still, like, what would have happened is they probably would have started and said, okay, we're making this new line of toys. Three and three quarter is what everybody makes, so we're going to start here. But then, w over time, they would have evolved into the, the figures that came out, as we all know, with you know, the big muscles and everything, the five and a half inch figures. But they would have started and prototyped them in the beginning as three and three quarter figures and then worked their way to the five and a half inch over time in development. So we really just wanted to come up with this idea of like, what happened if Kenner and Star Wars and those prototypes had been made real? And that's where the three and three quarter inch reaction figures for Master of the Universe came into play. Y en este caso dice que tiempo después una persona con la que habían trabajado antes, que después pues ya estaba trabajando Mattel, este, les dijo, se quedó a cargo de lo que era la franquicia de Masters of the Universe y se acercó a ellos y les dijo, ¿qué les gustaría hacer con Masters of the Universe? Y ellos dijeron, queremos hacer algo diferente, algo inesperado, algo que los fans no sepan que quieren, pero que en realidad lo van a querer. Y entonces dijo, bueno, vamos a hacer algo, ¿qué hubiera pasado si Kenner hubiera tenido la franquicia de Masters of the Universe y hubiera iniciado como las otras franquicias? ¿no? Primero con figuritas de tres, tres cuartos, este, y después de esto ir creciendo hacia los grandes musculosos de cinco y medio que conocemos, pero decidieron primero sacar estas figuras pequeñas para ir dando una idea ¿no? de cómo hubiera sido este desarrollo a través de Kenner si se hubiera manejado. And so, you know, over time then we've taken reaction into lots of different lines, we've taken it into Street Fighter, Hellboy, Toxic Avenger, and a lot of these are not the usual, ex what you would think you would want to make as a licensing company, but instead stuff like, what do I want to make? I don't want Hellboy from the movies, I want Hellboy from the comic book. I want Toxic Avenger because it's crazy. And uh, it seems to work, it's that same thing, we come back and like, what do I want to have in my collection? And we're going to make that, rather than trying to chase always what maybe the hot license is. Like I'm not making Five Nights at Freddy. Ok, en este caso dice que pues ellos decidieron empezar a buscar otras franquicias, este, pero pensaban, no quiero lo que las grandes franquicias buscan, sino yo quiero aquellas franquicias que nosotros queramos, ¿no? por ejemplo, tomaron Hellboy y dijeron, bueno, no vamos a hacer el Hellboy de las películas, queremos hacer el Hellboy de los cómics, también por eso empezaron a tomar el Toxic Avenger, porque es algo que les gustaba, ellos pensaban, yo no quiero lo que los grandes licenciatarios quieren, sino lo que a mí como consumidor me gusta como, como licencia, por eso no hacen Five Nights at Freddy's. And this is another example, this just came out at Comic-Con this year, but this is Lord, Sam from the Lord of Light. So this is Jack Kirby designs after DC and Marvel as a side project for somebody else. But it's one of those things like, it's such a cool design, we're like, okay, I have to make this, I want this Jack Kirby figure. And once again, I don't know if anybody's gonna buy it or not, but I really want Jack Kirby action figures that look like crazy Jack Kirby designs, so let's just make some of this stuff and see what happens. En este caso es, es algo que salió este año en la Comic Con de San Diego, que es un personaje, el Señor de la Luz, de este, que está basado en diseños de Jack Kirby después de que Jack Kirby dejó Marvel y DC. Y dijeron, bueno, queremos hacer algo así, una figura que tenga este sentimiento de Jack Kirby, que se sienta como algo de que diseñó Kirby con toda esta locura que caracterizaba los diseños de Kirby. Entonces, es una figura que tiene esa sensación completamente Kirby. Then we get to the worst. So, the, the tagline on the worst is, you know, there are good guys, there are bad guys, and then there are the worst. And the worst is our own creations. When we started talking about toy lines, anytime we talk about the toy line, the villain is always the coolest design character in the whole line. Skeletor is the coolest one in Masters of the Universe, you know, Maximilian's the coolest in Black Hole, you know, they're all always the bad guy is the coolest. So we're like, 
if we're going to make our own, own unique line of toys, let's just make it all villains. Let's just cut out the heroes altogether and just make all bad guys. En este caso dice que su siguiente línea fue The Worst, o sea, los peores, y que la, el lema de la línea es hay buenos, hay malos y están los peores. Y básicamente lo que pensaron es, bueno, en todas las líneas de juguetes siempre el villano es el mejor diseñado. Skeletor es el que tiene mejor diseño en Masters of the Universe, Maximilian es el que tenía mejor diseño en uh, El Abismo Negro. Entonces, ¿por qué no hacer una línea donde nos saltemos a los héroes, que todos sean villanos para que todos tengan diseños geniales? Cuando hicimos Do we have more? Yeah. And so this is the actual toys. Well, when we made them, we were like, I hope somebody's going to buy them, but I want to get them. And it's that same thing of putting out the things that you want. We went ahead and made these figures. We started releasing them. And then immediately people are like, I don't know what that show is. What's that comic book? I've never heard of that. And then now it's turned into, we're going to have a cartoon, an animated cartoon next year about the worst from the people that do Robot Chicken because they say, like, I love these worst figures, but had we not just sort of put out the thing we wanted, it wouldn't have happened. En este caso dice que, pues bueno, ellos sacaron las figuras, este, pues pensando a ver si había algo de mercado o no, y la gente las veía y decía, bueno, pero no conozco estos personajes, no sé quiénes, quiénes son las historias, no sé qué hay detrás de ellos, no sé si hay cómics. Y, este, y a final de cuentas ya hay planes para que se está trabajando para que el próximo año salga una serie animada por las personas que hacen Robot Chicken. Pero dice, pero esto no hubiera sido posible, no hubiera, no hubiera podido salir esta serie animada si no hubieran sacado primero el producto que ellos querían realizar. So, so then back to maybe more of a timeline. <laughs> In 2015, then we also then took over from Mattel. We asked them and we licensed Muscle. I was just asking Luis. He says you guys didn't have Muscle here in Mexico, but in America, these little tiny figures, and they were a dollar each at retail. So anytime you were at the store and you were throwing a fit, your mom would just grab a, a thing of Muscle to get you to be quiet. So every kid just had buckets of these muscle figures. And so we were like, why has licensing never been done for muscle? Like, I want muscle, but I want alien muscle and Masters of the Universe muscle and Robotech muscle. And I, I want muscle in everything. So we licensed it back from Mattel, the name muscle, and we started making every other thing we could think of in muscle so that we launched with Masters of the Universe in 2015. Okay, en este caso dice que con Mattel consiguieron la licencia de Muscle. Este, dice que Muscle, uh, de acuerdo a lo que le dijo Luis, nunca estuvo disponible en México, no lo tuvimos aquí. Pero en Estados Unidos era una línea muy económica, cada figurita costaba como un dólar y cuando estabas haciendo un berrinche en la tienda, tu mamá agarraba y decía, toma, llévatelo para que te calles. Y que la mayoría de los niños tenían cubetas y cubetas llenas de personajes de Muscle. Le dijeron, bueno, ¿por qué nunca se hizo licencias con Muscle? No? Entonces hablaron con Mattel y vieron la posibilidad de comprar el nombre de Muscle y empezar las licencias de entrada con Masters of the Universe. So, more muscle, this is Street Fighter and Mega Man. Más muscle, este, Street Fighter, Mega Man. And sort of then the big kickoff with us was when we were working on Masters, we went back to Mattel and said, hey, for San Diego Comic Con, we want to do something special. And this is when we were launching the first action figures and muscle figures. So we really want to make an event because no one's really doing anything to celebrate how awesome Masters of the Universe is. So we have a store in San Diego in downtown, not far from Comic-Con. So we ended up taking everything out of the store, and the idea was we were going to make it Skeletor's lair. So this is Skeletor's house. Y en este caso dice que para 2015 hablaron con Mattel y dijeron, bueno, vamos a hacer algo nuevo, ¿no? Porque tenemos la línea que va a salir ahorita de Mosul, tenemos este, las figuras de acción que van a salir, entonces nadie hace algo como para celebrar lo grande que es Masters of the Universe. Entonces aprovecharon que tenían una tienda en San Diego, no muy lejos de la Comic Con de San Diego, entonces sacaron todo lo que había en la tienda para convertirla en la guarida de Skeletor. So, when you walked into Skeletor's lair, it was, we took all these different references. So, when you walked in, in the South, in America, in the Old South, there would always be a big painting in the, right as you walked in of either the Lord of the Manor or the Lady of the House. So we went and we had a big painting made of Skeletor where he's like leaning on a fireplace with some brandy next to a bunch of books. You know, it's like you're in Skeletor's house. The wallpaper in the whole place is different masters of the universe, villains. You had to go to our booth at San Diego Comic-Con and get a coin to get into Skeletor's lair. And we made them at the same factory that made the Power of the Force Star Wars coins. 
you know, uh, on the back wall, we had like a hunting trophy, like he had gone out and killed Battle Cat, mounted his head on the wall. We just tried to have a lot of fun and really dial up the experience into something that you weren't going to see anyplace else. And then with the product, we tried to do different things. Like we had a mail away box of Masters of the Universe figures where it looked like if you'd mailed away from them in 1984 or 1983, and you know, the sticker is just laid right across the artwork, everything. We, the most popular thing that we did was we did a Chia Pet of Moss Man. I don't know, do they have Chia Pet here? Yes. Oh, Chia Pet. They're very tacky in America, and it's a terracotta thing that you put seeds on, and then they grow, and they make them for dumb things all the time. So we made one of Moss Man, so you can make a Moss Man grow. And it, the tackiness, but the funniness of it, people loved. In this case, they made a lot of things very interesting for the Guarida of Skeletor. They took a few references. In the south of the United States, when you came to the mansions, there was always a painting painted, either of the owner of the house or the lady of the house. All they did was a painting of the Skeletor, sitting next to a chimney, with brandy, books behind, so that you could know that you were in the house of the Skeletor. The tapis was made of pure villains of the universe, and they were always in the house of the Skeletor. They had a trophy of the house of the Battle Cat, like if you had come out and you had killed it, and it was in the house of the Skeletor. They had a trophy of the house of the Skeletor, and it was in the house of the Skeletor. El trofeo y bueno para poder entrar a la guarida de Skeletor tenías que ir a la Comic Con de San Diego y conseguir una moneda. Las monedas fueron hechas por la misma fábrica que hacía las monedas de Power of the Force de Star Wars. Y bueno algo que querían hacer diferente fueron estas cajas de juguetes que eran muy similares a las que podías haber pedido en los 80s y que te llegaban por correo. Entonces las cajas tenían así la, la etiqueta de correos pegada encima del arte y cosas por el estilo para que se sintiera auténtico. Y otra cosa que hicieron fueron las mascotas de chía como esas que venden ahí el señor pastito que le pone en este agua y eso para hacer a Mossman, entonces este, se veía bastante curioso porque pues, le echabas agua y empezaba a crecer la hierba como en Mossman. And so it was very, very popular and that was sort of, you know, really got Mattel's attention as to us doing more with Masters of the Universe than maybe they were doing on their own. So when we did 2016, we we're like, okay, we have to top Skeletor's Lair last year, caught everybody by surprise. What do we want to do this year? And so what we came up with is the fact that no one has done a new cartoon since the 80s. So we went back, and originally it was three minutes, then five minutes, and we ended up with a brand new 10-minute Masters of the Universe cartoon. And we animated it, we got the original voice actors, we got everything done, and we made it a brand new, never before seeing cartoon for San Diego 2016, and then we made all the characters that were the villains in the new show as five and a half inch classic action figures. So it was almost like we were bringing the past back to life once again. In this case, it was that for 2016, it had to be something que superara o que se acercara a lo que fue la guarida de Skeletor en el 2015, entonces lo que hicieron fue hacer una animación nueva, que originalmente iba a ser tres minutos, después cinco minutos y terminan siendo un episodio de diez minutos, un episodio completamente nuevo de los amos del universo, no se había hecho algo así desde los ochentas, donde consiguieron las voces originales e hicieron una caricatura de los amos del universo reciente, donde este, teníamos a Skeletor y teníamos todos estos villanos que tuvieron su figura de acción en un estilo completamente retro. So, and then in 2017, so this year, we started working on a lot of new things. One of the new things that we started doing was uh, we did an 18-inch Aliens Warrior from the second movie. As many of you know, the old 18-inch Alien from Kenner from the 80s is extremely expensive and rare. So, we all had that one as collectors, but I wanted the Alien from the second movie as well. I wanted to continue that line. So, we went and made the Xenomorph from the second movie has a different head, different hands, different forearms, different feet. But we made like, here's, you have the old one, now let me make you the other one from the second movie. And, you know, something new and crazy and probably not the best business idea, but something that we really want. In this case, it says that in 2017, what they did was new ideas, and among them, pues de niños tenían la figura grandota de Alien de 19 pulgadas de la primera película, pero pues ahorita esa, esa figura es carísima, difícil de conseguir, lo que hicieron es, ¿por qué no continuar la línea? 
y decidieron hacer una figura similar a la de Kenner, pero de la segunda película, tiene diferente cabeza, diferentes brazos, diferentes piernas y es como continuar dentro de una misma línea. Dice, a lo mejor es la, una idea muy loca de negocios, a lo mejor no es la mejor idea de negocios porque no se sabe si hay mercado para algo así, pero al final de cuentas es lo que querían hacer. And so, what really happened by the time we got done with 2016 and the second Skeletor's Lair and the new animation is the people at Mattel basically came to us and said, you guys are doing so much better of a job at interacting with the fans and keeping the legacy and inspiration of Masters of the Universe alive. You know, how, how do we, how can we work better together? Which then came to basically by 2017, they allowed us to take over everything Masters of the Universe, including what is known as the Classics line, as well as uh, Club Grayskull. En este caso dice que entre 2016 y 2017, después de ver lo que hicieron con la guarida de Skeletor, después de ver la animación que hicieron, Mattel dijo, ustedes están haciendo mucho más con los amos del universo de lo que nosotros hemos hecho y están haciendo un magnífico trabajo interactuando con los fans, entonces pues les dieron la oportunidad de tomar completamente la franquicia de Masters of the Universe, incluyendo lo que son las figuras de... Este, de la que se conoce como Masters of the Universe Classics y también del Club Grayskull. And then, so once we took it over, one of the first things we did was, uh, which just shipped and some people here have brought them up to us, is we did what was called the ultimate figures. We went back and said, okay, what are the figures that fans need to start a collection or update their collection the most? And what do we have that we can really come back to? So, Let's start all over again, give play, people a place to come into Masters of the Universe and buy the classics and Club Grayskull line. So we did this line called the Ultimates, which is we went back to He-Man, Skeletor, Faker, Tila, and Ram Man, and went back and found every accessory, every piece that had ever been made for these characters over the years, and put them all together in one package. So now you didn't have to go pay $200 on eBay to get uh, a Tila, you could now get a Tila and start the line on your own and really just try to give everybody else a fresh start on being able to collect Masters of the Universe again. Y en este caso dice que lo que hicieron fue pensar, bueno, ¿qué podemos hacer que sea diferente? ¿Qué podemos hacer para resculpir, para que la gente se vuelva a interesar en esto? No solamente tomar los clásicos. Entonces lo que hicieron fue buscar todas las piezas, todos los accesorios, todas las cabezas que se habían hecho de algunos de los personajes. Tomaron estos cinco personajes que tenemos aquí y metieron en un solo paquete todo lo que tenían, todas las cabezas, accesorios. Y es como surge la línea Ultimate, que ya no tenías que entrar a eBay para pagar 200 dólares por una tila. Ya podías conseguir aquí esta tila que tenía todos los accesorios todas las cabezas e iniciar por ti mismo tu propia colección desde un principio. And that sort of brings us up to today, I think. And uh, we have lots of other stuff we're working on, some stuff we're supposed to talk about tomorrow. And then if you go out here in the back right corner, you can see the five and a half inch prototypes that we're still working on to make five and a half inch classic style figures, but that match the animation. So we're just trying to make toys that we want to have and that I think the fans want to have as well. And uh, I think that is what makes us maybe a little different from a lot of other toy companies. Y en este caso nos lleva hasta el día de hoy, donde todavía hay muchas cosas en las que se están trabajando, cosas de las que van a hablar el día de mañana en el siguiente panel, pero también si ustedes se van aquí al área de exhibición, en la última hilera hasta el fondo, hay algunos eh, prototipos de lo que se está haciendo, de algunas figuras de Masters of the Universe, donde lo que se busca es que lo más parecido a la animación que se pueda. Okay, para tratar de hacer, seguir haciendo cosas, innovando cosas, buscando aquello que el fan, que ellos mismos quieran, que algo que realmente le guste a la gente. Aparentemente ya no tenemos tiempo para preguntas, pero ya saben que ahorita, en cuanto bajen de aquí del podio, eh, se pueden acercar a preguntar cualquier cosa personal. Este, la verdad es que es para nosotros, eh, nuevamente lo voy a decir, es un honor tenerlos aquí y que nos puedan compartir un poco lo que están haciendo. No se pierdan la plática de mañana que va a estar especializada en Amos del Universo. Entonces, eh, bueno, los quiero despedir con un aplauso, por favor. Gracias. Sí, por favor, pasen a visitarlos a su stand. Eh, vean lo que están haciendo. Vean también las figuras que están en el museo. Este, muchísimas gracias, Brian, Josh, Luis, Juan. 
Y pues continuamos aquí en Unboxing Toy Convention. Muchas gracias.